Hello again. I feel like talking about something completely different from usual this morning, which is a subdivision of science fiction called steampunk. I have an insatiable interest in science fiction and, dare I say it, an encyclopedic knowledge of the subject manifested by an enormous library of old sci-fi books dating back an awfully long way. Steampunk has been an interest of mine since the 1960s, before the expression was even coined. So this video is going to be slightly longer than usual, and only those who have any interest in science fiction, particularly steampunk, will probably wish to watch it. In January 2018, a company chaired by British businessman Sir Richard Branson proposed building passenger carrying tubes to link London's three airports, Heathrow, Gatwick and Stansted. It would, it was announced, ju take just five minutes to get from Heathrow to Gatwick by this means, the carriages travelling an estimated 670 miles per hour, approximately the speed of sound. I might mention in passing that this ambitious scheme has now been abandoned. It was a scaled-down version of something proposed the previous year by American entrepreneur Elon Musk, pioneer of privately funded space travel, who claimed to have been given permission to build a tunnel stretching 200 miles from New York to Washington DC. Trains would be propelled at 700 miles an hour along this so-called hyperloop by creating a vacuum and so assuring that there would be no air pressure to slow down the train. Newspaper reports in July 2017 described the scheme as being futuristic and space age. Accompanying the press release were artists' impressions of what this new railway might look like were it to be built. The whole enterprise sounded very up-to-date and modern, an exciting innovation in travel for the 21st century. There was also something curiously familiar about these supposedly new ideas for high-speed travel. The thumbnail to this video shows a drawing published in 1829. This seems to be an early version of something which looks uncannily like the Hyperloop, labelled on the side Grand Vacuum Tube Company, direct to Bengal. In other words, rather than running for a mere 200 miles between two cities, this was a proposed intercontinental vacuum railway, one which would carry passengers from Britain all the way to the region comprising present-day Bangladesh, a distance of 5,000 miles or so. It must be said that this cast Elon Musk's suggested rapid transit system into the shade. In 1895, almost 70 years after the drawing of the Intercontinental Vacuum Tube Transit System appeared, the Strand magazine in London published a fictional account of a transatlantic tunnel linking Liverpool and the American city of Boston. Passengers would travel along this vacuum tube at over a thousand miles an hour, crossing the Atlantic in just two and three quarter hours. Surely, though, this is just a Victorian fantasy. There could not have been any real possibility of a vacuum railway in the 19th century, could there? A vacuum railway tube was actually operating in London's Crystal Palace Park in 1867. It ran for just 600 yards, but those prepared to part with sixpence, a little under 3p in decimal currency, could be drawn along a tunnel in the same way that the New York to Washington Hyperloop might one day operate. Nor was this the first railway system to exploit vacuums and air pressure to draw trains along without their being pulled by locomotives. As early as 1847, trains working on this principle were running between the English towns of Exeter and Newton Abbott. The journey time of 20 minutes was faster than the electric trains running on this route today. And in 1870, an atmospheric or pneumatic transport system began operating in a tube beneath New York. Both the Crystal Palace, South Devon and New York pneumatic railways were powered by stationary steam engines, which meant that passengers were not troubled with all the smoke, steam, dirt and noise, which were inescapable features of travel by steam trains at that time. 
The 19th century was, after all, the age of steam, and it was used for every conceivable purpose, powering printing presses and factories, as well as transport on land and at sea. Vacuum railways sometimes feature in novels and short stories belonging to that genre of science fiction called steampunk. Harry Harrison's A Transatlantic Tunnel Hurrah, first published in 1972, tells the story of a vacuum railway being constructed in a tube which lies on the seabed of the Atlantic Ocean and will connect Britain and America. The word steampunk may require little explanation. The Oxford English Dictionary says that steampunk is a genre of science fiction that typically features steam-powered machinery rather than advanced technology. This is a very rough and ready definition, and steampunk enthusiasts often have their own more idiosyncratic ideas of what constitutes true steampunk. For some purists, the narrative must be set in the 19th century and preferably resemble the world of H.G. Wells or Jules Verne. No sooner had the Oxford English Dictionary included steampunk in their dictionary than complaints were heard that the word Victorian should have been used in the definition. There are those, though, those who reject the need for steampunk and Victorian to be inextricably linked. They are inclined to include in the steampunk canon books set in the modern day, which depict an alternative world which has evolved following some point of divergence in history, the Confederates winning the American Civil War or the failure of the American Revolution, for example. Such worlds are almost invariably more backward than our own, at least from a purely technological perspective. There are, of course, exceptions to this general rule, as in this steampunk classic. The difference engine, which has computers revolutionising life in Victorian Britain, this is one of the earliest examples of a true steampunk novel. <coughs> the first recorded use of the word steampunk dates back to 1987, and 30 years later steampunk has expanded to include not only literature, but also computer games, graphic novels, art, clothing, various accessories such as walking sticks, fob watches and glasses, and even music. The word refers now not merely to a type of science fiction, but to an entire style of fashion. Although the expression steampunk was coined only a little over 30 years ago, the concept itself has been around for a good deal longer than that. Early instances of science fiction or fantasy tales which feature anachronistic technology, steam-powered aeroplanes say are sometimes referred to as being proto-steampunk. Queen Victoria's Bomb by Ronald Clark, which was first published in 1968, is often cited as being a proto-steampunk work. The plot concerns the development and testing of a nuclear bomb in the 19th century and its proposed use to bring a decisive end to the Crimean War, fought between 1853 and 1856. Bring the Jubilee by Ward Moore, first published in 1953, is another book which is reckoned by many to belong to the category of proto-steampunk. Set in 1950s America, the petrol engine has not been developed and steam-powered mini-bills are the only self-powered road vehicles. Heavier-than-air flight is also unknown and steam engines drive the balloons which sail overhead. In a transatlantic tunnel hurrah, which I mentioned earlier, set in an alternative 1973, there are aeroplanes, but there is a neat twist. Instead of being powered by kerosene, as in our world, the fuel which they use is pulverised coal dust. While the tunnel of the title is being created, these coal-fired aeroplanes fly overhead, belching smoke into the sky. Steam aircraft are commonly to be found in the world of steampunk. This can surely only be a preposterous fantasy. 
There may have been vacuum trains in the real world, but it can hardly be the case that steam planes were flying across the skies of Victorian England. We turn now to the 21st of September 1894 edition of that respected American journal, Scientific American, and read to our surprise, on Tuesday, July the 31st, for the first time in the history of the world, a flying machine actually left the ground, fully equipped with engines, boiler, fuel, water and a crew of three persons. Nine years before the first flight of the Wright brothers, we are reading an account of a steam-powered aeroplane taken to the air in the English county of Kent. This was, by the way, no flimsy construction of wood and canvas, such as the Wright brothers were later to experiment with. The aeroplane described in the Scientific American was made of steel, weighed three and a half tons and had a wind wingspan of 125 feet. By way of comparison, a well-known modern airliner, the Airbus 320, has a wingspan of only 117 feet. Victorian Britain was an unfamiliar world in reality of steam planes and radio phones, a mechanical internet and cable news service, as well as the first self-propelled buses in the world, which were steam-powered and ran, ran regular services in London and other British cities in the 1820s and 1830s. To say nothing of steam-powered racing cars, which reached the unbelievable speed of 127 miles an hour. It is the world often portrayed in steampunk fantasies, except that this world was real. The fact is that although steampunk is a specialised fantasy genre, it's actually founded in historical events, most of which have been forgotten. Who today remembers the first wireless telephone, invented in the 1870s, or the solar power, power plants of the same period? The fact is that the real Victorian world frequently resembled that depicted and referenced in modern steampunk, so often that it's hard to distinguish sometimes between the two. Imagine for a moment electric jewellery, brooches, tie pins and hair clips which are battery powered so they light up and move, a miniature skull which can be worn attached to a shirt and whose eyes flash while the jaw clatters up and down. It is precisely the sort of novelty which one might find today if you were to go on Amazon and search for steampunk. In 1885, electric jewellery, including such items as glowing owls to pin to one shawl and illuminated electric walking sticks, were to be found in the brochure produced by Gustave Trouvé in Paris. The battery was kept in the pocket or handbag and when required could be connected up so that the butterfly in a woman's hair could light up and flap its wings, for instance. One feels sure that there must be a market for mechanical insects and skulls of this sort among today's aficionados of steampunk. We can see then that the origins of modern steampunk lie both in forgotten Victorian inventions and also the speculative fiction which was popular in the 19th century. And these combined with the so-called proto-steampunk novels of the 1960s and 1970s, set the scene for the steampunk genre as we know it today, and they allow us to see clearly how it developed in the way that it has.